Welcome to the Lit Lounge by MOCA at the MLK Memorial Library in Washington, D.C. April is returning Citizens Month, or as President Biden has called it, Second Chance Month for returning citizens. And in honor of that, we are talking to Desmond Mead, the author of Let My People Vote. We discuss his journey, his relentless pursuit of getting Amendment 4 passed in Florida, which allowed roughly 1.4 million returning citizens the right to vote. Fascinating story. You don't want to miss this. Hello, Desmond, and welcome to the Lit Lounge. How are you? I'm fine, Mocha. Thank you so much for having me uh, with you today. I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation. So am I. I've been um, looking forward to it to, since we met. So your story is so incredible. And your book, Let My People Vote. I mean, I read this book and I, I think I told you, I, I, it's um, a life changer. It's a, it's a, it really is. There were so many points in my life that I was like, wow, he really, he's, he's pulling me up. Um, but let's, let's, let's let everyone else get to know you too. Uh, for those who don't know you, um, Desmond, Desmond Mead, author of Let My People Vote. So let's start with the beginning of your story. Um, tell us, tell us how your story, how you, how did Desmond come to be? Tell us about your early life. Wow. So first, let me, let me just say this. I'm like, it really makes me feel good to know that, that you've enjoyed the book. And, and even when I hear from folks, you know, who have bought the book, how it has impacted their lives, I'm really touched because this is, my, I'm a first time author. So this was the very first book and I was, I was nervous because I was wondering, you know, how relevant it was going to be, you know, how people was going to receive it. Did I put enough in there? Uh, did I put too much in there? Did I focus in one area more than I should have or whatever? And, and so, you know, to hear, you know, folks uh, uh, come back and tell me that, you know, that the book has really touched their lives means a great deal to me. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I wanted that book to, to let people know who Desmond is, you know? Yes. And let me yes. tell you, I, you know, when you ask me where it began or who, who, who was Desmond, you know, I, 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 I go back to that, that church song uh, called Ordinary People, not the John Legend one, right? But uh, mm -hmm. we're talking about how God uses ordinary people. And that's what I think, I'm thinking just the ordinary uh, a, a man who, you know, I, I was born in the Virgin Islands. Um, I moved to the United States at a very young age. You know, I think I had a pretty decent upbringing. You know, my father was a preacher, you know, um, and my mom was one of the most loving women I've ever known in my entire life. Um, you know, like in any family, we had a blended family. There's, you know, a lot of uh, ups and downs, but Overall, you know, I think that um, our family was bound in love and and we overcame whatever we needed to overcome. Uh, but in my personal journey, you know, uh, in my search or quest for love, you know, I end up falling off the rails a little bit, you know, and, and um, getting um, caught up in, in the drug game, right? And, and really end up becoming an addict um, and, you know, before long, you know, that just took me a whole different direction. But at the end of the day, I'm an ordinary guy who pretty much had a, a, a ordinary upbringing, uh, mm -hmm. but was given an opportunity to do extraordinary things in an extraordinary yeah. uh, 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 time. And, you know, like the guy, that, I, I don't know who said it, but they said there's no such thing as luck. All right, what it is is about being prepared to take advantage of opportunities when it presents itself. I was just a guy that was brought through some things that prepared me to take advantage of an opportunity to do amazing things for our community, for our country. Right, right. And your, your modesty, your modesty just kills me because I mean, um, yeah, it's you've done so much, but we're going to go through all of all of that. But um, you, you spoke uh, in the book about um, wanting to, watching a funeral and saying that you wanted to just be 
in life, you just wanted to be adored and revered. Um, once you left the earth, you wanted that same thing for yourself, for people to have loved you. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, you this know, this is in the my, beginning. Yeah. This is in the beginning because we're going to move out <laughs> that evolved. Yeah. So, it, no, one of my earliest uh, uh, memories, I mean, as uh, like I said, I left the Virgin Islands um, at around five years old. So I was yeah. extremely young uh, when I experienced a, a funeral in the Virgin Islands. And I could, I would never forget just the, the pageantry of it, you know, and, and just uh, how so many people, it had to be someone famous or important. Um, but I know that a lot of people were there. Um, while there were tears, there was, it was still a celebration and that people was really celebrating this, this person's life. And it is all that had always stuck with me. And so later on in life, you know, when I was at a crossroads, you know, that memory uh, came flooding back and actually influenced, you know, me actually preparing for my own funeral. But right. um, that's one of the a few, a handful of memories that I have when I was uh, a, a little kid. But uh, no, and I've always been fascinated with, with funerals and, and with death, you know, that mm -hmm. knowing that someday I am going to die and it could be any minute, you know, it could be years from now, but you know, how do we live in relation to death? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, it, in the book, it um, is very interesting how you kind of reconcile that and find your purpose because you realize that in order for those things to happen, a person must have lived a great life and, and done great things. So it's really not about the death. It's about the kind of life you live. Yeah, you're right. You know, it reminds me of that. Uh, I think it was a poem that talked about the dash, right? That on, 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 on a headstone in the graveyard, you will have the year someone was born and the year that they died. Uh, but mm -hmm. there's that dash in between, and that's the most important thing, you know? And, and I think that how you uh, operate or how you exist in that dash period uh, have an impact on, on what happens after you pass away or at the time of your passing. I think one of the, the what, what I love the most about this book is the running theme that um, pulls it all together or keeps it all consistent. You talk about purpose throughout the whole book. I mean, so, so many people might think that this is a technical book on uh, Amendment 4 and how you get amendments passed, but it's a book about purpose. Um, when you, uh, you, you were in the United States um, and things went wrong, how, how did they go wrong? What happened? How did things get so terribly wrong that led you to the crossroads or the train tracks? You know, I, I, think, go? You know I think it's a culmination of so many things, you know, especially, you know, even the discussions that we're having now with current events, you know, that there are systems in place that basically sets you up that actually uh, I would call them unforgiving systems. Right. And, 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 and cause when you look at even like what's happening today, where, you know, for instance, I give you a great example, you know, when it, we talked about the, 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 the murder of, of Ms. Uh, Derek, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so many other folks who uh, police officers say, Oh, we were threatened or, you know, we felt uh, uh, we had some kind of fear and then turn around and see a video where a white guy is basically running over police officers and taking off in the truck with police officers hanging off of his truck, but not one shot is fired. You know, that theme comes out that, man, we don't have, as a black man, I don't have much room for error. So I can't, I can't get away with reaching for my cell phone, even though a white person can get away with brandishing a gun, right? Mm -hmm. And still not get shot. Something as simple as me reaching for a cell phone, I can't get away with. And so, you know, when you talk about what led me there, it's first of all, understanding that there are systems in place that are unforgiving, that do not give us uh, any room whatsoever for error. And the minute something goes wrong, now we're caught up in a system and now it has that snowball effect. And so with me, 
what really uh, played a major role in getting me into that system and, and or caught up in that system was my drug use. You know, yeah. um, just starting to use um uh, 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 uh drugs and and, and, and drinking uh it, what it eventually did it was it, it it landed me in trouble in the military it landed me in trouble you know in the civilian world um and once i got caught in that system then you know <laughs> there was little room for error for me uh and right. eventually um you know i ended up in front of railroad tracks i could tell you though um there's a part in that book that is very um, it was very hard for me to write. Um, okay. um, and you know, I still get like emotional thinking about it now. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not only like the system, but how the system impacts our community. Right. And, and how, how a system can cause us to hate our own, right. Or to reject our own. And therefore, when you even turning to your own and get rejected, that takes you to a deeper place. You would think, well, maybe I'm strong enough to fight the system, but I can't fight the system and have to fight my own, right? And right. I remember the day before I, um, the day before I was standing in front of those railroad tracks, actually going to a church, Yes. Right. And end up walking out that church thinking that even God has turned his back on me. Right. And, and the, the type of re, uh, interaction I had with the pastor of that church that, you know, that contributed. So, you know, it, like I said, it, it's, it's a combination of so many things, but understanding that when we, for the sake of not only this conversation, but for future conversations or discourse uh, that we, that folks can engage in, you know, I like to talk in terms of the broader picture, which is that we have a system that is unforgiving for black men uh, uh, in particular, um, that if any, we make any false move, then we would get thrown down this path that's totally, uh, uh, um, totally, totally uh, different than the path that we dream we dreamt about, right? Wanting mm -hmm. me wanting to be a pilot, me wanting to be a lawyer, me, you know, wanting to have some measure of success. Yeah, we could easily get a sidetrack because the system is set up uh, to take us down a different route. Exactly, exactly. And it, I, I, I hear what you're saying. With you know, sometimes you, you know, you go to your own for help, and um, for whatever reason or it could just be an off day for them, but they have no idea that it's life and death for you. So yes, it, it right. um, as, as the greatest love of all says, at, at some point you, you learned that you, you had you, <laughs> you know, to depend on and you had to find the strength within yourself to make that turn. So there came um, a point where you came in contact with, um, you know, addressing your substance abuse problems. And um, it, was, it was amazing to me that when you did that, um, your problem turned into the pathway to purpose. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, and so just to be clear, you know, and, and, I, and I mentioned it, that that wasn't my first go around at trying to get help, right? No, a lot of people think it's like a one and done thing, right? Oh, just go get help and you'll be all right. But for a person that's an addict, sometimes it takes more than one chance or it takes more than a, a second chance or even a third chance. You know, that was actually um, my, my second um, drug treatment facility that I even entered into, right? Uh, but this time it was something a little different than the last. And really, I think that encounter at, at the railroad tracks and the thought about death the thought about uh, preparing for my funeral, uh, that you know, which was uh, uh, grounded in this, uh, um, I would say, in this frame of mind, it had me thinking about what have I done while I was on this planet, right? And yeah. and wanting that funeral and and questioning what I've done, putting those two together, and and and, and coming up with a way that I could use the pain and the suffering to help other people. Even though I didn't know how I was gonna do it, I just knew that somewhere or another, if I could just take those elements 
that led me to the railroad tracks uh, to make me want it in my life. If I could package it in such a way so other people wouldn't have to go through what I've gone through, then maybe I could have an impact, a big enough impact. So when I die, I'm able to fill the stadium full of people uh, who are mourning my, my death. And I can tell you that um, the first encounter I had with someone who approached me and, and, and told me that it was something that I said that caused them to experience a paradigm shift or, or caused them to have a, a brighter outlook in life. Um, when that person told me that something had erupted in, inside of me um, that I, I had never felt before in my life. You know, and today yeah. I, 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 I can tell you that it was a joy that I never knew existed. It was a joy that I was chasing and didn't even know I was chasing it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but understanding that joy was really understanding what my purpose, what God's purpose for me was. And it was so simple. It was just to give back that no matter what position I was in, no matter what title or non-title I have or how much a little money I have, that there's always someone else that's worse off. There's always someone else, right, that could benefit uh, uh, from encountering you. And that was so liberating. But it also, you know, what it did was it, it served as the fuel, right, for me doing the things that I'm doing. That That's my purpose now, right? At the end of the day, it is what can I do when I wake up every morning? What can I do to improve the life of someone? or improve the lives of a community, of a country, you know, what is it that I can do that can, uh, something as simple as put a smile on someone's face. Right, you know? right, right. So it, you seem to be saying in this book quite clearly, um, with I'm piggybacking off of what you just said there, that um, addiction um, is really about chasing joy and joy comes from purpose. That's like the major, wow, I got from this book and how you were able to move from next point to next point to next point. You found joy and even after overcoming, well, not overcoming because they say you, you're, you never overcome it, you just manage it, but you understood <laughs> that it's really joy that you're looking for and you became a, ment uh, a mentor. Is that what they, what are the, the accountability? Um, partner as you went through the AA program? Yeah, you know, that was something that was, you know, one of the things that they, that they, that they teach you is about service and about giving back. And one of the ways you give back is that after being clean for a certain period of time, that they encourage you to take meetings to treatment centers, to share your experience, your strength and hope, right? And, and, and so I dove into that, you know, I would, I would go to about four to five treatment centers each week, right? And so you're going there and you have folks that are in either uh, 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 dealing with alcohol or uh, um, substance abuse issues and you're speaking to them and you know, you're just sharing your story with them. Uh, and then there may be a Q and A afterwards, but in the sharing of your story with them, right? What I found, was that it did two things. Um, number one, right, it brought out some things in me uh, uh, that I didn't even know was inside of me. And I realized that, man, I, I was speaking more for me than for them, right? And then the other thing was, is that it, it kind of created a level of accountability, knowing that that you are, you know, in front of these group of folks who are, are, are scared, are struggling, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you, can actually be a beacon of hope to them, right? Which makes you want to continue in your recovery because the last thing you want to do is dash someone's hope because you relapse, because you end up as a client in the same institution that you used to come to to, to speak. And so it really helped me be accountable for my actions. Uh, and it really helped me uh, especially when some of the things that I, that I've said to them, I didn't know where they came from. Right. But right. it was meant for me and it really made me uh, do a lot of soul searching. And that's one thing that is consistent in recovery. It should be consistent in life period is that we are engaging in self-reflection, right? Consistently and constantly. 
right? It's not always about what other people are doing to us. It's not always about, you know, someone else or something on the outside, right? That we need to spend some time looking internally and seeing what role do we play or how could we change our ways? Because it's much easier for us to change our ways than it is for us to change someone else's ways. And that comes from the serenity prayer uh, that you find in the rooms anyhow. Right, right. And I'm sure it also uh, cultivated your um, your ability to speak in front of crowds and really capture them and really connect with them because you, when you speak in front of crowds, they are, I mean, on the edge of their seats. I'm still nervous. <laughs> I tell you that. <laughs> so listen, I, it, 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 when I say that sometimes people really give me that funny look, but I still think I'm a shy person. You know, right. um, yeah, I still get the butterflies, um, whether it's speaking in front of 20 people or 200 or 2000, you know, I, you know, I still get a little nervous, you know, okay. but um, I try to center myself. I try to really connect with the energy that's in the room. And then, you know, I always say what I say every time I go to speak, man, God, please just use me the best way you, you can, you know, right. and, and I just let that spirit just flow through me. And, and what happens uh, most, if not all of the times is that, you know, there was someone in that audience that needed to hear what I had to say in the way I said it, you know? Okay. And, and so that made everything a success. One of the, one of the fascinating, another fascinating thing about you is that um, you take the path that's not necessarily the standard path, um, but you get there. So you discovered in prison that you had, uh, 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 what would you say, a talent for interpreting and applying the law. Um, and then you took that. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk about that first. Um, you had a talent for reading and interpreting um, the law and applying it. And not only did you help yourself, but you helped several people while you were serving time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was a little kid, Mocha, um, uh, one of the shows I used to always look at was Perry Mason. And so okay. I was already fascinated with being uh, an attorney. Uh, but of course, you know, life happens and, you know, got sidetracked uh, with my drug addiction and everything else. And I totally just lost sight of all of that. It wasn't until I was convicted in uh, 2001. I'm sentenced to 15 years uh, and I'm sitting there in the prison wondering, you know, cause typically what happens after you get sentenced, uh, especially if you go to trial, there's uh, like a 30 day window that you have to be able to file an appeal, right? Um, on your, of your conviction. And, you know, I'm sitting there waiting and I'm seeing the clock ticking and I'm not hearing anything from an attorney you know, and I'm, I'm calling the public defender's office. I'm not getting any responses. And, you know, before you know it, the time had elapsed, which meant that legally I could not file, I couldn't even appeal my case. And so uh, going into the uh, prison law library, you know, I had to try to figure out what can I do? And someone told me that I could actually um, file some legal documents to ask the court to allow me to file an appeal, even though it was late, right, for an exception. And, you know, I, when I started researching that, and the best thing that the guy did that I ran into did for me was that he didn't do it for me. And he said, I'm not going to do it for you, right? You're going to have to do it. I'm here to help you, but you're going to have to do the work. And uh, when I just started you know, going through the law books, man, that, that fire was rekindled from so many mm -hmm. years ago. And I was fast. I've always been an, a, a, an avid reader and you know, those law books are nothing but stories, right. right? That's what they are. They're nothing but stories. And so I was easily consumed by the cases and I ended up drafting my um, the legal document. It was a writ uh, habeas corpus uh, petition for belated appeal. And, um, when I filed it, I actually got a favorable response and I'm gonna tell you in prison, you know, um, you know, overwhelming majority of post conviction 
motions or, you know, um, uh, legal requests made by people who are incarcerated or have been convicted after they've been convicted, you know, they don't, it's not, it's not, a, 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 um, it's not likely to happen. You know, I mean, it's, right. it's chances are slim to none that you're going to get something favorable on the post conviction motion. And so when I was able to get a favorable response, the word spread like wildfire. Right. And so, you know, I had a lot of folks that uh, approached me and, you know, I selected who I wanted to work with. And I'm, one thing I'm proud of is that in my entire time being incarcerated, any legal motion or any legal document that I worked on or had a hand in uh, always received a favorable response. So I, I batted a thousand in, 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 while I was incarcerated. And right. that's phenomenal uh, considering that it's rare for people to get favorable responses from the courts. Right, right. So again, fascinating because you're seeing how you're, everything's being set up. The seeds being planted for helping um, uh, incarcerate the incarcerated population at the time and then mm -hmm. you know so the seeds were planted in there um your love for the law planted in there so let's move forward now desmond goes to school this is after you come um you know you come out of prison you're you've gone through the the um a program you're speaking and desmond dares to dream to go to school so <laughs> how did that how did that start for you and Oh, why man. did you even think you could do it? And well, because that's a just... long that's a long story. But I'm a, I'm a, okay. So, so <laughs> I'm gonna try okay. to tie the two. I'm gonna uh, try to tie the two of... because here's the deal, right? Because you talked yeah. we talked about uh, me uh, with uh, um, actually uh, uh, reigniting my passion for law while incarcerated, right? Mm -hmm. There's one story that sticks out with that that would lead to what you that what you're saying. Okay, cool. Uh, it was I remember it was a young man. Uh, I'm at my camp, my prison camp, and there was a young guy who was, I believe, direct filed as a juvenile, right? Which meant he was charged as an adult and he was sentenced like to an insane amount of years, maybe around like 30, 30 or 40 years. Um, and I remember the guy, he, he was a real cool, real uh, even tempered guy. Um, and for some reason, something happened that caused him to ask someone in the law library about his case. And uh, I started helping out with his case um, a little bit. And what happened was this guy was illegally sentenced, right? And the reality was he was not supposed to have been sentenced to, I think, like any more than like five years or something like that. He was in, he was he ended up being sentenced to 40 years. But here is this. Here's the thing. When he got to prison, he just accepted the fact that that's the life that he was going to have to live for the next 40 years. And he fell right in line with the norm, right, with the routine. And he's going to the rec yard. He's lifting weights. He's playing basketballs. He's uh, uh, um playing the, the boards, right? Uh, betting on game. And he's just surviving like they teach us to survive in prison one day at a time. Right. At no point in eight years that this guy was incarcerated, did he set foot in the law library to see if there was something wrong with his case, right? And he threw away all those years, right? Because he dared, he did not dare to think that his life could be better than what it was, right? And so when I got out and 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 I still had to deal with my drug addiction, right? Because I I got to the railroad tracks after I was released from prison, mm -hmm. but coming out of 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 drug treatment, you know, my first motivation was doing something that would prepare me or strengthen me to prevent me from relapsing or using drugs again. And I figured that if I go to school, um, maybe what I can do is, is that would like raise my self-esteem and level of self-esteem. So I don't have to use drugs anymore, right? Cause I know if I, if I were to get in front of those railroad tracks again, maybe this time I wouldn't be so lucky. 
Right. And so that was the initial motivation. But while uh, um, going to school, while engaging in some type of community service, you know, I started to think about things differently and realize that, listen, I don't have to just be your ex-convict, right? That's uh, barely surviving, um, uh, working a low-end job, not having degrees or all, all that kind of stuff, right? That I don't have to say my life would never be one in which I live in a nice house, uh, have an amazing job with amazing family. I don't have to, I don't have to resign myself to live in a world that society put forth for me to live in. That I can dare to think outside the box. I can inquire, right? I can see, can I make something different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can I change things around? That young man didn't do it for eight years and he lost eight years of his life, right? right. I was not gonna travel that same route. And right. so at any opportunity I had to see, is there something different that I can do, you know? Oh, wow, should I be happy that I got accepted in the school? Uh, um, and just, just go through the routine of, uh, 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 of attending classes? No, nah. what about starting a, um, a, a, a student or organizations that's dedicated right. to giving back? What about yeah. doing this? What about doing that? And so it's about, you don't, whatever situation you're in, you don't have to accept like the norm. Yeah. Right, that you can go outside of that. Right, and and a lot of people don't realize that. Okay, you we have Desmond that that is the um you know the executive director of the FRCC, but I don't know if everyone realizes that you went from community college to your bachelor's to finishing law school, um, and even finding out that you had a learning disability while helping everyone else in, in F1. Everyone knows that the first year of law school is the hardest. You uh, didn't make it through the first year, but helped everybody else study only to find out that yet here's another obstacle. Not only did they say, okay, all right, you know, bye, you can't, you can't finish law school, but even in your appeal, then to find out on top of that, you have a learning disability and getting through that and finishing law school, like amazing. Wow, you know, the way you said it, I'm like, man, who's that guy, man? He, he is amazing, right? <laughs> and then to think that, you know, even to, to lead the effort to uh, uh, re-enfranchise 1.4 million people, the, F, the exclamation uh, 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 point on that is the fact that, I'm, and I'm an African-American man. Yeah. Right. Because here's the deal that, you know, there's this unwritten uh, 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 um, feeling, right, that, oh, maybe people of color, they're good, but maybe they're not good enough to actually lead uh, 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 a, a campaign, uh, a successful campaign at that, you know, yeah, they, they, they have some good things to, to lend to the campaign, but they're not as uh, uh, strategically savvy to be the head person. Maybe they could be the good number two or whatever, you know, because you didn't see that, you know. Um, but, you know, the think that, man, wait a minute, not only did I have to overcome those obstacles, but I did it as a black man and then turned around and led a campaign, a successful campaign, a very impactful campaign as a black man. Yeah, sometimes I sit back and say, wow, who is that guy? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, and, and it, it's again, so looking at how, um, you know, moving to the FRCC, um, tell us how about the organization, how you got started in it yeah. again, how, and it's fascinating to see how every step of your life prepared you for this role and prepared you for Amendment 4. So before we go into Amendment 4, just tell us about um, FRCC. Yeah, so um, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition uh, I was first introduced to it in 2006, actually a year after standing in front of those railroad tracks, I, uh, I attended the convening in August of 2006 uh, in Tampa, Florida. And that's when I was introduced to the FRRC. And it was basically a email, an email listserv of some of the top orgs in, in the country. You know, you had your 
uh, Advancement Project, uh, NAACP, uh, ACLU, Brennan Center for Justice, the Sentencing Project. Uh, I think we even had um, a group of uh, African uh, AME uh, uh, churches that was in, involved. And then we had local state groups as well. Uh, at one point, I think it was over 70 national and state state organizations that made up this coalition uh, of orgs that focused primarily, uh, actually solely, on ending felon disenfranchisement in Florida. But it was only an email lister, which I didn't know at the time that I joined. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't until 2010, uh, 2011, that I discovered that it wasn't even an entity. Uh, and by that time, I, had, I was the president. And so what I did was I officially incorporated Florida Rights Restoration Coalition and my founding board members were all people who had previous felony convictions. And so I took it from an a, a email listserv that was dominated by organizations to a non-for-profit that was led by people who were closest to the pain. Uh, and so we officially became uh, a state recognized organization in 2011. And um, we're right now we're we're statewide. And here we are in 2021, have over 18,000 members, over 20 chapters throughout the state. And we're steadily growing um, as we're engaging, not only in uh, addressing felon disenfranchisement, but also criminal justice and reentry reform as well. Right, right. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know until your book that uh, Dr. Rosalind Osgood was a returning citizen. I didn't know. I that, yes. wow. And she's she's a major force in Florida. She in is. Florida. She's actually running. Uh, she's going to be running for the state senate now. You know, wow. and and so that's amazing to see that someone who was uh, addicted to drugs, who was living on the street. Uh, could, when given the opportunity, can turn their life around and become a member of the school board, one of the largest school boards in the uh, country, right? And, and just do some amazing work in her community. She was an early source of, of inspiration to me. To let me know that, yes, we can think differently. We don't have to resign ourselves to living the mundane life of a person with a felony conviction or with uh, an addiction to drugs or alcohol that we can do extraordinary things. We just got to think outside the box. And we have to, I think, let the driving force behind our work be love. Right, right, right. And it's, it has, it's interesting to me as well that you've always applied the same thing, your love of learning, um, because who would, who would think Amendment 4 was even possible? But I like how in the book, again, it's not technical, but it's your passion that kept pushing you to learn more and more about what do I need to do? What do we need to do? What um, partnerships do we need to make? Whether it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, you know, what do we need to do to gather together to get this amendment even possible and then passed? You know, several years ago in, in, in DC, remember it was the anniversary, I think, of the March on Washington, right? And uh, I remember going to, um, I want to say Howard University, an auditorium on that yeah. Sunday. They had all these big time preachers there. You know, it was it was a, a beautiful service there. Um, and they had a panel and one of the people that they were speaking to was one of the older civil rights activists. And I remember we were talking who were asking them, right, what kind of polling did you do before? launching the campaign, the, uh, the civil rights campaign. And they just laughed at the person asking that question and were like, well, what type of focus groups did you use or whatever? They laughed, they were like, we knew none of that. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't about polling, it wasn't about focus groups. What it was about was that it was the right thing to do, right? It was a humane thing to do. And, and, and that was the driving force. And you know, you know, that's how I approached the campaign as well. You know, but understanding that, yeah, we're going to need the polling and all that, especially when you're trying to get people to invest significant amounts of money uh, in the work that you're doing. 
But what drove me from the very beginning had nothing to do with polling. It had everything to do with the fact that it was the right thing to do, right? And that when the debt is paid, it's paid. And, and fair is fair, you know? And, and so right. if a person, you know, I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. That's why pencils have erasers and we have the, the back button and whatever, you know? At the end of the day, you know, once a person has paid their debt, they should be allowed to move on with their life. It's only right. You know, I know Mocha, when you, when you pay that last car note, you're not expecting to get any more bills in the mail talking about pay such amount of money. You're like, these people must have bumped their head. Mm -hmm. right? I, I paid that off in full. And mm -hmm. that's the same thing that people should be able to move on with their lives and experience, you know, the American dream, right? Yeah. And not have that, you know, the prior felony conviction be hung over their neck, you know, um, yes. for the rest of their, their lives. Yes, so Amendment 4 passes and Desmond is able to cast his vote. You're able to cast your vote. Take me to that day and how, how take me to that day. Wow, the day I cast my vote, you know. So let me let me just back up because when we passed Amendment 4, you know, first of all, I, you know, I knew that it was special what we were doing. And I knew that we had the potential, the, the impact of Amendment 4 would trans, uh, 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 transcend the uh, state boundaries, right? That, you know, it, it just wouldn't be confined to the state of Florida the impact of it to be felt across the country. I knew that. What I didn't know was the, the, the level of reaction that I got from folks who couldn't vote before. That man, that when they found out that Amendment 4 passed, oh my God, we were, we thought, okay, after we passed Amendment 4, we could take a vacation, right? Because I basically, I've been on the campaign trail for about four or five years. So, yeah. It's time to exhale now and, and, and take a couple of days off. But that wasn't the case because there was just so many people that was like touched by it uh, that they wanted to register to vote. And so, and then we had to deal with the Florida legislature that decided they wanted to put their hands in it. And right. they end up uh, um, creating what they want to call maybe implementation language, which now within that language had provisions that required people pay outstanding fines and fees. Right. And then there was an the ensuing right. lawsuit and all that. So there was a whole bunch of drama mm -hmm. from the time we passed Amendment 4 all the way to the time that I finally got an opportunity to exercise the benefit of Amendment 4. Right. Understanding how many people, I mean, it was like a, a emotional roller coaster. You know, one minute you think you're free, then, not, then the next minute, or maybe you're not so free, right? Right. Then the next minute you think, okay, well, well it looks like we are free. And then the next minute it's like, we're not so fast. You got to do this. Right, you right. Do that. I was going to get to that, but yeah. I wanted to keep, keep on the joy, the yeah. high first, but, and then we'll but, get to that. But there's some high in that. Let me tell you. Yeah. And that's something okay. that I found out that even in the darkest moments, we could find joy, right? Okay. Even in the darkest moments, we could find hope, right? Okay. And that is so important. Because, and, and we could take the obstacles and turn them into opportunities, right? Okay. Now obstacles take on a whole new, different meaning now. But right. in this, that journey, and, and, and the reason why I touched on it, yeah. because all that played a role in leading up to in August when I voted in our August primary last year. And, and it was the first time that I voted uh, in over 30 years. In yeah. over 30 years, um, probably even longer than that, to be honest with you, but over 30 yeah. years. And, and by the way, just for context, the presidential election, uh, it was my first time ever voting in a presidential election last year. But wow. let's go back to the August primaries. Been over 30 years. I'm walking up. I don't know. I don't even know what to feel. Cameras on me, the whole nine yards. Um, I'm with my family. And as I was walking up, I'm thinking, wow. I think I'm walking on sacred or hallowed ground. Right? right. And And I had that thought because... I thought about the blood that was shed, right? There's a whole lot of blood that shed on American soil so my black behind could have the opportunity to vote, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking about, you know, my ancestors who were hung and 
on, on trees and bitten by dogs and had all kinds of craziness done to him. And, and, and to think that my ancestors faced almost certain death just to leave their house to go to register to vote. And then they had to turn around and face it again just to go vote, right? Just so I could have that opportunity. So they faced death multiple times for me to be able to freely walk up to a place and cast a ballot. And so I had to honor that, right? And I had to realize, man, that every step that I was taking towards that uh, a voting location, right? Every step that I was taking was made possible because of the countless sacrifices that was made. And so when I go in there and I get my ballot and I go in my special booth that's by myself, it ain't no lights and none of that kind of stuff. It ain't no scoreboard and none of that. It's just me by myself privately in this booth, right? And as I started to fill out uh, uh, the, the ballot, started to really just understand that what I was actually doing was I was engaging in a sacred act, right? That me actually voting is sacred. Thinking right. about what went down so I could have the opportunity to vote told me that what I was doing wasn't something trivial, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't, right. It, wasn't, it wasn't something that was like, you know, uh, 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 um, a waste of time or whatever you couldn't, you couldn't, you, 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 the, 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 the quality and the, the value of what I was engaging in was priceless. Right. Which meant a couple of things, right. Meant that, wait a minute though. That means that if anybody want this, right. Then they've got to put a little more respect on it and they got to earn it. They don't just yeah. get it because they're black. They don't just get it because they have a, a D or R or I next to their name. No, do you, no, you have to earn that because this thing right here that I'm doing is just as sacred, right? Yeah. And, and which also meant that I had to put respect on my vote as well, right? And as I was going through all, of, all these thoughts was going through my head, you know, it, it, it dawned on me that the act of voting actually transcended partisan politics. It transcended even the, the racial biases. Um, and the act of voting actually took me to a place that said something really simple yet powerful. It said, I am. Yes. I am. Yes. Right? yes. That, that is an affirmation of not only my humanity, but my uh, 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 existence and my rightful place in the grand scheme of things as part of a society which my voice does matter right my life matters and I can make a difference I can be the master of my destiny right mm -hmm. um that you know I could change things you know that I don't have to once again resign myself to believing that the life that was laid out for me is the only, or the life that I'm living is the only life that I have to live. That I can change, right? I can try to do something different. I can inquire, right? And voting said all of that. And, and, and so I, you know, when thinking about the people who couldn't vote because they had the restrictions and, you know, I felt sad for them, but it also strengthened my resolve because of what I felt to fight even harder to make sure that at the very minimum, they at least have an opportunity to experience what I experienced. Right. And I'm gonna tell you, so the, the last thing is that i would never forget, it was on Facebook, the young man said, he got on Facebook and he said, I'm not gonna lie y'all, all these years I've been watching y'all vote, I've been really jealous of y'all. And he had the opportunity to vote and he went, after he voted, he got in his car and just broke down crying. That's how much it meant to him. But he was actually jealous of people. And, and I, could, I, I could relate to that. Being jealous of you guys, being able to go and vote and, 
you know, and choose who you want to govern you. And people like me didn't even have a, 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 a say in none of that. Right, right. Does the, the magnitude of your purpose ever overwhelm you? Oh, <laughs> Every so often, yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not, <clears throat> it might sound strange, but sometimes I try not to think about it because I just get overwhelmed. And, you know, I'm like, once again, let's go back to the very beginning, man. I'm just ordinary guy. You know, that's who I am. I mean, y'all put too much on me. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I just want to just, just be a blessing and to make my world a better place. You know, I've done some things in my life that I'm not proud of. I may have hurt some people as well. Uh, mainly family members, people who love me. Um, and, you know, I just want, you know, my mom who is in heaven now, I know she's proud of me. You know, I, I just want family that's living to be proud of me, you know, and not be that person where they got to look and shake their head, you know, say, man, them, right. that, them drugs, man, he had so much potential. Man, this, right. man, that, you know, no, I want, I want to be able to just be a good person, man, and just know that, when I do die, that my time on this earth was beneficial to someone, right? And so right. the other stuff about, oh my God, yeah, sometimes I just, I, I, would, run, I would run from it because it can get overwhelming. Right. Um, yeah. Right, right. And as you're talking, I couldn't help but think, you know, maybe the, um, the, the, uh, some of the, the restrictions that they put on in the implementation of um, Amendment 4 is just there also to keep you going because you're not finished at Amendment. You've still got work to do. But yeah. it's, it is Returning Citizens Month, April, Second mm -hmm. Chance Month, as, as um, President Biden has called it. Tell us, why should returning citizens have the right to vote or their rights restored? Why? For the same reason that you should have your right to vote. <laughs> right, for those who may you not know, understand. Because at the end of the day, yeah. Here's the deal, you know, um, I tell folks that nothing speaks more to citizenship than being able to vote, mm -hmm. point blank. Um, and, you know, I, I think about, I have, I have four boys and if anybody have any sons, you know that they are almost guaranteed to do some crazy stuff as kids growing up. Some things that make you scratch your head and make you want to grab them and like, what were you thinking, right? Yeah, mine is starting. He's 11. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, you're going to have a lot of those moments. Oh, right. <laughs> but here's the deal, Mocha. And this is something I discovered that no matter what your son does, yeah. no matter what he does, guess what? You're going to always be your son. Right. No matter what my son do, no matter how much they may piss me off, they're still a me. They're still my son. And I think that no matter what an American does, Right. They shouldn't stop being an American. They're still an American. And the thing that says that more than anything is the right to vote. Right. Absolutely. That's, and, and so that right there by itself is like at, sits at the core. But then when folks want to get a little fancy with it, you know, come up with all kinds of reasons, whatever. You know, one thing I say is this. Right. Almost every last one of us want to be forgiven for things that we do, right? You're rarely going to find somebody who's going to say, hey, I don't ever want to be forgiven for anything I've done for the rest of my life. Anybody right. going to say that? We all want right. to be forgiven, you know? And, and, and that forgiveness, redemption, restoration is also a concept that sits at the heart of people of faith, of any, any faith, whether it's is Islam, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, that those, those are some concepts that is like interwoven into the fabric of these uh, of religions, you know, and in particular, you know, um, with, um, cause in the Florida, you know, you, you lose your right. Then you got to wait at one point you had to wait five or seven years before you could apply to get your rights restored. And, and even after waiting the five and seven years, it seemed like it was like a, an additional 10 year waiting period. So matter of fact, let me just, let me, let me break it down like this. Mm -hmm. Like the, the way the rules were set up, if, if you were to have been found guilty of a crime mm -hmm. and you completed your sentence to date, right? This is April uh, 22nd, right? 
2021. You would have to wait until April of 2028 before you allowed to apply to have your rights restored. And after you apply in April of 2028, it would not be a minimum until at least April of 2038 before you see if you have a shot at having a hearing. And if right. you're lucky enough to have a hearing, when you walk in that hearing in 2038, right, you had less than 1% chance of getting your rights restored, right? And right. to make this thing real, I was just at a clemency hearing last month in which an attorney uh, stood up and it's on the Florida channel and talked about how he had a client who applied to have his civil rights restored in 2008 and he is still waiting for a hearing, right? And so when you look at that, my first reaction is I go back to the Bible, to that story about when Christ was on the cross dying for our sins, right? Because nobody perfect, right? We mm -hmm. all make mistakes. Just some of us get caught, right? Others don't. But at the end of the day, Christ is on the cross dying for our sins. And there was a criminal, so-called criminal, that was next to him that asked Jesus to be saved. And so my question to folks has always been, Jesus didn't say he had to wait five or seven years, did he? What well, Jesus' response was, this day you shall enter into paradise, which that interchange or exchange between Jesus and that criminal is what is in uh, speaks to what sits at the crux of this of all our religions that grace is instantaneous right that forgiveness the redemption the restoration this stuff is instantaneous and so yeah. therefore you know if if your son makes a mistake or or commits an offense or whatever his grace should be especially when he was punished and he served his time you have to restore him back. You have right. to. There's no hoops. There's no, no. it's just. Pure, pure simple. Yeah, yeah. When it's all said and done, what do you want um, to have left behind on this earth? What do you want that dash to represent that Desmond Mead came here and? Man, to help shift a narrative that created a more uh, an environment that was more conducive, uh, more conducive to creating a better society for us all. And what I mean by that is, and we see it today, there's so much, there are so many different variables at play today in, in what's going on in our society. And there's so much division and fear and hatred, right? And I am a firm believer, Mocha, that there is a much better place that we can be in, right? Now we could point fingers and we could do all kinds of stuff, but at the end of the day, you know what I'm saying? What is that world that we want to get to? And let me tell you, mine is real simple, right? I want to get to the type of world, right? That we see after a natural disaster, right? It might yeah. sound weird, right? I want to get to the type of world that we'll see after a, 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 a fire at, at a home or a, a car accident, right? That's what I, that's, a, that's where I'm trying to get to. And, and to break it down even further, right? I'm, I'm going to use you as an example. You know, you, you driving down the expressway, Mocha, right? And as you're driving on, you're on 95, 95 South, right? All right. <laughs> you're headed to the ATL, right? And somewhere, somewhere along the way, you see an accident ahead. Right. And you decide, you decide now that you're going to stop your car. And you stop your car, you get out of your car, you run up to the scene. There's someone laying on the ground, right? When you approach that person, Mocha, your first question is not going to be, did you vote for Donald Trump? Right. Your first question is not going to be, what's your sexual identity or what's right. your immigration status or how much money you make, right? It's none of that. Your first question is going to be something along the lines of, are you okay or how can I help, right? It's in those moments, 
right? That humanity is great. It's in those moments that our community and our country is great. When you see natural disasters happening and communities coming together, they don't give a damn about your political preference or your sexual identity. All they see is the humanity in you. And that is what they're responding. The humanity in them is responding to the humanity in you, right? And you are afforded all dignity and respect that you rightfully deserve as a human being, right? And it's those moments that that I know that we don't have, why do we have to wait for a natural disaster to operate in that sphere? Why do we have to wait for an accident? And if, if it could come out during those moments, then that means it could come out in other moments as well, right? And it could be a more permanent fixture in our society. There are a lot of forces that play against that, right? But the mark that I want to leave, right, is a per is during the time that Desmond was on this planet, he was driving our society towards that mark, where we can love each other, and treat each other humanely and with respect and dignity, regardless of the color of our skin, our socioeconomic status, our sexual identity, our immigration status, or even previous con uh, conditions of confinement. Right. That at the end of the day, if we take those labels away, what do you see when you see me, Mocha? Human it's what I see when I see you. Mm -hmm. I see a child of God. I see another human being. I see my sister. Right. My mother. Right. You know? Right. And then I think, well, how do I want to treat those who I love? Right? What do I want to happen to them? You know, when folks ask about, well, what would you do around, like, say, for instance, juvenile justice reform? I said, well, no, you don't have to ask me. Ask yourself, what, how would you want your son or daughter to be treated were they to be caught up in that system? And that, you can start there, right? How do we want, you know, people to be treated if it was someone that we loved, right? And that can happen when we see each other as someone that we love. Right, right. Oh, well, Des Desmond Mead, um, you know, this book, everyone, <laughs> this, this book, I, I thank you for your transparency. I thank you for your, for your willingness to be so transparent. Um, this book changed me. I, I always had a vision, not always, but you know, I had a pretty good sense of vision and purpose and, um, you know, for my life, but how dare I ever give up? <laughs> how dare I ever say that something is impossible, that I can't do it, that I can't keep going, or that I have a label and this is why I can't do it, or I've done this before in my life and this is why I can't do it, that, you know, everyone who reads this book um, should know and understand by the time they finish with it that you're, if you're given a vision, you're just given a vision. Don't even ask about the how, don't ask about how yeah. it's gonna, the vision was given to you and mm. everyone has a life purpose. That's what I got from this. How dare I give up? So I thank you and everyone that is going to pick up this book and check it out from the library. And you know, once you check it out from the library, you're gonna wanna go buy more, give it to your people. It is that good. They, they um, need to bring it back so other people can check it out too. No, I mean, don't be like how I used to be back in the days. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's got to be a staple in their home. Yeah. Um, you know, when all of this is over, we'd love for you to come actually um, in the Lit Lounge, come to DC and visit us at the MLK Memorial Library. Um, and, and so that people can really, so you, they can get their book signed, one. And, um, you know, they can really uh, touch and feel you because uh, thank God for your life and thank God that you answered the call. We, we really appreciate you. Um, thank, thank you so much, Mocha. And I'm definitely looking forward to coming uh, to the Lit Lounge. I tell you that, I'm gonna have my <laughs> uh, my hat and my cigar and everything. I'm, yes. I'm, listen, I'm, I'm dressing the part and all that. All right. Yeah. Okay. And don't, and it's, and our cognac, don't worry, we can do that too. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you. It's returning citizens month and you may not be a returning citizen, but we've all made mistakes. But the point is 
what do you do after the mistake has been made? Is that the end of your life? No, you keep going. There's no excuse for not fulfilling your purpose and to live the life that you were meant to live. See you next time at the Lit Lounge.